Good afternoon, everyone. So the topic of today's panel is how uh, my colleagues and I on uh, um, today's panel and the organizations that we represent, how we allocate our capital um, and how we divide up the asset bases that we're all uh, very uh, uh, blessed to have, how we allocate our capital and those asset bases to advance and improve learners and their trajectory, if you will, as they, as they transition between education and employment. And why it is that the way we have allocated our capital may have changed over time, which, which I think it has, um, and what we're learning and how it can continue to be improved. So when I talk about capital allocation, what do I mean by that? And what do I mean by how it's changed over time? So I have the advantage now of um, uh, having, um, you know, having been in this space now for a few years. So when I first started out, uh, actually where Patrick works, the Gates Foundation is about 12, 13 years ago, typically the way we allocated our capital at Gates was we provided grants and we provided grants to nonprofits. And then while I was there, I was there for about four years, we actually started making investments and we started making investments in small for-profit companies. But we were relatively unique. There were a few other foundations that did the same, but it was still primarily grants. Then I left for a few years, worked in the for-profit sector and came back and I've been at Strata now for just under eight years. And when I came back to Strata, even eight years ago, the space had, had, had transformed and it, it, it continues to transform. And by that, I mean, um, it was much more common, much more common for foundations to do both grants and investments all around advancing their respective strategies and missions. And moreover, there were a whole new bunch of uh, organizations that I hadn't heard of before. So groups like New Profit, um, uh, groups like um, Omidyar, for example. So not only were we allocating capital differently, but we also had different groups that were in this space, some of whom were nonprofit, some of whom were foundations, some of whom are not. We had Strata, for example, are not a foundation. In some cases, there were, um, uh, you know, there were specific organizations that were established to have both nonprofit and for-profit arms as well. And so the space really transformed in a fairly quick time around how, how uh, large organizations like Gates or Strata or the other that are um, or the others that are on the panel today allocate their allocate their resources. And so what we really wanted to dig in today is why that is, why that's the case. What have we learned? What what precipitated us to do that? What have we learned? And what gaps remain? Um, and if we um, have enough time at the end, and I do a good job of moderating, we'll be able to, <laughs> to uh, specifically work with the audience, ask the audience questions around how how we can uh, do do a uh, do an uh, uh, improved job, if you will, at, at both how we're structured to maximize impact, but also from your perspective, what are we still not getting right and missing? So um, with all of that said, let me introduce today's panelists. First off, I'm Tom Dawson from uh, Strata Education Network. We also have Dr. Angela Jackson with us, who I uh, take it, Angela, you've changed jobs recently. She's now the Chief Ecosystem Investment Officer at Kapoor um, uh, Enterprises, while she still um, retains her role as an advisor to New Profit. We have Amy Clement uh, from Imaginable Futures, which is an arm of the Omidyar Network, uh, where she serves as managing partner and a board member. And last but not least, we have Patrick Methvin from, from the Gates Foundation. So um, rather than me continuing to talk, why don't I turn it over to Angela to talk about how both at Kapoor and at um, New Profit, they've approached some of the questions that I, I just mentioned. So Angela, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Tom, and good afternoon. Thank you for staying late to be with us today. So um, as Tom said, I'm Dr. Angela Jackson. I'm the Chief Ecosystem Investment Officer at KPOR Enterprises. KPOR is based in the Bay Area, and we do impact investing, and we've been doing that across a couple of decades. Prior to that, I was the managing partner at New Profit, where I led our future work investments and also our economic mobility investments. So before I launch into what we do, I, I do want to share the lens from where I'm coming from. I am a former social entrepreneur. I launched an organization that I ran for eight years. Additionally to that, um, I did my doctoral research really on capital flows, and my research was around using capital as a lever for systems change. 
I wanted to explore how can you use capital in ways, different types of capital, to actually have social impact. And I studied many foundations, impact investors. And so when I came to my work at New Profit in Kapoor, really thinking about the sensibility and the learning and the insight from that research is nothing new that you all know. Entrepreneurs, depending on their life cycle, depending on their business model, you need different types of access to different types of capital. And so when we looked at New Profit, you know, it was really entrepreneur-centered. It's a venture philanthropy firm that's based in Boston. And 20 years ago, uh, New Profit tried to do something that was really unique in the field. Um, when they were giving dollars, a lot of foundations will give it for a specific program. What New Profit wanted to do was really focus it on a venture capital model and give unrestricted dollars. So what we did then is what we do now is that we invest a million dollars over three to four years into entrepreneurs to scale their impact. And we leave it to the entrepreneurs. We think that they're the experts of their problems, the problems that they're trying to solve. So we leave it to them to t say what they want to do with the dollars. In addition to that, while I was at New Profit, we had been investing grant capital into social entrepreneurs. I began seeing this trend of for-profit organizations that had a mission-driven lens, and they were working at the intersection of profit and purpose. At New Profit at that time, we didn't really have a vehicle to invest in those entrepreneurs. I was very interested in those entrepreneurs because one thing, and I think one critique of the, the social sector is about scalability and sustainability. And if you have a market-driven solution that can also have impact and have a customer at the end, a payer, that means that that organization has a chance at sustainability and lasting a long time and hopefully creating more jobs. Parallel Paths, um, K-Port Enterprises has always thought that way since its inception. K-Port Enterprises was founded by Mitch Kapoor. If some of you all know, back in the day, he was one of the creators of Lotus Notes. Um, he used his private wealth to create a, an operating foundation. Um, it also, underneath the K-Port Enterprises, we have an early stage VC fund where we invest in founders at this pre-seed and seed series. There's a foundation where we also invest in 501c3 with grant capital, and then the area that I lead is our mission-related investments, and with those dollars, investing in entrepreneurs who I like to say are making a more equitable world. So we're investing in entrepreneurs who are solving for education challenges, accelerated learning, we're investing in climate justice, we're investing in transportation, childcare, the things that really make for a person to have a choice-filled life and be able to engage in society. And when we think about the, the extra capital flows and why we really structured ourselves that way, is we wanted to be we wanted to center entrepreneurs, the social entrepreneurs who are solving problems. It wasn't about a governance structure that worked for us. We really want to be in service of entrepreneurs, and that's the same, very similar with new profit. And so when you do that, there are creative ways, which my colleagues will speak about, that you can do both. You know, to certain entrepreneurs who need grant capital, you can structure a way to do that. For ones that need equity investments, because that sends a different signal to the market, we have a structure that can do that. And then the other interesting thing about KPOR Enterprises, which I'm really excited about, is that we have a robust research arm to support our for-profit and non-profit entrepreneurs as they think about really telling their story and their story around impact. Thanks, Angela. I think next uh, we'll turn to Amy and then Patrick, and then I'll, I'll bring up the rear. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I can't believe you're not having a cocktail right now. <laughs> so cheers to all of you. Um, Amy Clement, I'm with Imaginable Futures. Uh, we exist for the same reason all of you are here at EDU, which is we really believe that learning is critical for well-being and for healthy, equitable societies. Um, we spun out of Omidyar Network. We're not actually part of Omidyar Network. We, we were previously the education program area or initiative of Omidyar Network. Uh, Pierre Omidyar was the founder of eBay. Uh, he and his wife, Pam, um, have founded and funded many different organizations that focus off on a, on a host of, of areas. We represent the work on learning and, and human development. Um, we, you know, just like a little bit of history, uh, sort of how we got to where we are. Um, I joined Omidyar Network back in 2010. So I was part of the early PayPal team. We got acquired by eBay. That's how I got to know Pierre. 
And we were founded on this sort of belief in the power of innovation, which I deeply believe in, right? So we invested in for-profit and non-profit entrepreneurs who are working sort of at the edge of innovation to create social change. Um, and, and we did it in the, we were sort of, you know, in the venture philanthropy space, general operating, multi-year grants, supporting them with coaching, leadership development, you know, internet marketing, whatever they needed, very much in the sort of the VC model. Um, and, and same when we made equity investments. And what we learned over time was we had this like very flexible capital, right? Very flexible, we could do anything with our capital. But as we invested in all of these entrepreneurs, and we were cross-sector at the time, so I made investments in healthcare, energy, learning, you name it, was our impact was just the sum total of our portfolio versus actually figuring out how we could get that capital to work together to further create change. And so over the past like eight years, we've really been on this journey of how can we have really like recognizing that innovation is absolutely necessary some of it focuses on the symptom, and we need the symptom for today's problems, for today's people who are, who are impacted. And we also have to shift the underlying system and the underlying patterns, which are significant. And so we've been, just, we've been taking more and more of a systems approach. And so about eight years ago, we focused more on sectors. I raised my hand to lead the education work. Um, and um, we now invest, or have been investing, in a handful of countries in Africa in Latin America with a focus on Brazil and in the United States, um, really looking at sort of what's the context and what's needed in those specific geographies. Um, and, um, you know, I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, I think we've come at this from like slightly different angles, but my sense is where we're concluding is it's all needed. <laughs> it's all needed. Education in particular, it's part social sector, part public sector, part private sector. So, you know, we actually need all of those players and we need all those players coordinated. I'll follow up on that. Uh, Patrick Methen, the director of the post-secondary success strategy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we have not spun out of that network, um, at least to my knowledge uh, as of latest. A um, uh, few comments. We still, to, um, to Tom's point, we were an early innovator in different forms of capital, although many passed us by in terms of innovative uses of capital. Uh, we do, the bulk of our investment is grants and contracts. Uh, we do have a strategic investment fund that puts about $2 billion of balance sheet money to, to use with some form of return expected. And we have dabbled a little bit uh, in the past five years in um, subsidiaries. Uh, it's usually when there's a big gap in the market on innovation. So, uh, Gates Medical Research Institute is something that we uh, funded, created. They have about a $100 million operating budget um, to address. Uh, it, there is nonprofit biotech to address issues that are not addressed by the market. And um, But in the post-secondary space in education, we're a little bit more squarely in grants. We do, we do some uh, PRI-type investing. I think that the couple things that I would say... Um, in a bit of a compare and contrast to my colleagues on the stage is, is we're not investing as much in the entrepreneur or the designer of the thing, although we do a little bit of that. We invest, I think, more in the system uh, because you know, the whole premise of this discussion about different types of capital makes an assumption about what the markets will do, and markets are super, super powerful. I do believe the Gates family believes in markets, but in education, the markets are irrational and highly distorted against our focus population, which for the Gates Foundation, that's black, Latinx, indigenous students, and students um, from low-income backgrounds. So to feed into a system, a version of capitalism that we exist today in, it becomes an amplifier of the inequities in our society. And so like figuring out the angle, and I think we each have different approaches on doing that, like unlocking that piece is really important. The way we go about it is, you know, we spend a lot of money to distort the market back. So for example, we invest heavily in data systems. Um, so Texas happens to be one of the few states that connect its education and labor market data. I, I don't know why that's like a thing to, to say out loud, but one of the few states that do that. How are we gonna talk about addressing the issues and the inequities that you can see through the entire pipeline if you don't have some basic data that we can agree to. So we invest pretty heavily in data because we believe there's truth in that. Um, we also look at things 
like in the systems, about um, quality standards. So what makes something good, what makes something bad? With the idea being, then you've got entrepreneurs, like what Angela talks about, investing into a space to say, oh, I can actually prove that this thing is better through the research and whatnot and compare it against things. And so that's another thing. And so what we're trying to do in many cases is actually the distort the market back towards equity because I do not think markets will take you there on their own. Um, so those are a few things we're, we're thinking about right now. Um, happy to pass along, Tom, for, uh, for you to do your part. And then I think we've got some rapid questions after that. Yeah, so as I uh, was listening to my colleagues, I realized Strata is the only, uh, the only organization profiled on this panel that isn't linked to a high net worth individual uh, in terms of where the money originally uh, uh, came from. We're a, we're a little bit different in that sense, obviously, or a lot different in that sense. Um, but we, we originally uh, started out in the student loan space um, from the 1950s. So um, about eight years ago, we decided that we wanted to do something else. And we had an opportunity to move into more of the social impact space that my colleagues are in. And so when we, when we did that, we said, what's the best structure? What's the best, A, strategy? And two, when we had that strategy, what's the best structure to accomplish, to accomplish our mission? And so our strategy, as I think probably most of you know, is to improve the connection between education and employment with the real focus on learners. Um, and, and um, you know, historically, especially when we were in the student loan world, we were very focused on student access. Um, then thanks to Gates and other organizations like, like them, there was a real focus on college completion, which uh, still needs a lot of work. Um, but we were focused on how can we not just get students over the um, hurdle with respect to completion, but how can we really improve the connection to employment? And then, um, you know, over the course of the last eight years, um, um, you know, I think you've, you've, you've seen sort of the economic environment really, really reiterate the importance of that, given, given the job crunch, given, given uh, um, just, just, just broader trends in our economy around ensuring that uh, students and learners graduating from college, whether it's a community college, a four-year college, um, some kind of non-traditional path, um, have the skills requisite to meet the demands of tomorrow's labor market. Um, so when we develop that, that, that strategy, we asked ourselves the question, what's the best structure to accomplish uh, and drive impact relative to that strategy? And we, we landed on the structure that we have because we didn't think any one avenue, whether it was grants, investments, another key distinction with Strata is we actually kind of what um, Patrick was describing a bit with Gates, we actually own uh, and operate a limited number of, of, of nonprofit affiliates. And we didn't think any of those three channels by themselves were sufficient to address the problem that we were trying to tackle. Um, and so our grant making portfolio, I, I should also say the other reason that really motivated us to do that and to take that approach is, you know, we're blessed with a you know large capital base, but it is you know it's not the Gates Foundation. It's 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 not the size of of um, you know a number of the larger foundation or 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 you know larger um, you know larger charitable organizations across the country. And so our thought was because we have um, relatively speaking a little bit more of a limited capital base, what's the best way to drive impact? And I suppose we could have doubled down and been a foundation or doubled down and just done investments. But our thought was, A, we need to learn what, what channels work better and for what purposes. Um, but we didn't want to make the bet. And we didn't think that, that, that just, just looking at the way the space was evolving and looking at how other organizations were taking a broader approach to how they they allocated capital to drive impact. We didn't think that, 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 that just opting on investments or opting on grants was the way to go. And so um, at present, we deploy um, roughly uh, 20 to $30 million a year in the form of grants. Um, we have a somewhat smaller, what we call strategic investments, comparable to what um, I think Angela was describing in her work at Kapoor. And then we operate uh, um, four different Four different nonprofit affiliates, um, all focused on improving the connection between education and work. And the last thing I'll say about, well, I'll, I'll say two more things. Specifically, as it relates to the affiliates, 
We also noticed in the space that um, in terms of supporting the work of nonprofits, a lot of, of, of support that went to them, grants historically that went to them, would fund administrative expense, would fund overhead. And so we thought, what's a better economic model to support those affiliates so that they can really focus on driving their mission, which is what any nonprofit should do, and what's the appropriate role for Strata to support them? And where we landed was really, we support really the back office administrative side of things. So that's all the boring stuff that you uh, um, sometimes take for granted, but is critical in the operation of any organization, especially um, you know, smaller nonprofits and growing nonprofits. So everything from legal to IT to accounting. Um, but then in addition to that, because we're a nonprofit, we also do some of the things that Angela was describing. So we have a large research and evaluation team that goes in and evaluates the impact of our affiliates. Um, and also um, um, our grants and investments as well. So that was a deliberate approach that we took in terms of how best to support these organizations was, was to provide more of the kind of administrative back end. That's also important because these affiliates still go out and raise money from other, other foundations and other supporters. And when, when they go out and do that, we can tell them that in addition to providing grants in some cases to our affiliates, we're really supporting the administrative back end. So therefore your grant, when you provide a grant to, to support education at work or Inside Track or one of our other affiliates, you can be assured that that's really going to drive impact as opposed to um, essentially paying for overhead. Uh, last but not least is since, since um, putting this strategy in place, we've also um, identified what, you know, kind of three distinct phases of impact. You know, I think um, Patrick was talking a little bit about how Gates tends to invest in the system uh, uh, more so than some of the other uh, um, um, colleagues on the panel. Our approach, we, we come at it a little bit differently. Our approach is that we need to invest in systems. We also need to invest in innovation. We also need to invest in the scaling of innovation. And so we really look at three different phases of impact. The first is innovation and identifying what works and having an evidence base around what works. Note the uh, comment earlier on having a research and evaluation team that does a lot of that work for us. We then scale and look at um, um, getting other support uh, for, for the innovations that we've identified and seeing if that when we take them to scale, those, those positive effects on learners persist as, as they grow. And then last but not least, we focus on if we can support the scaling along with other supporters of these effective um, innovations that we identify, either through our investments, our grants, or our affiliates. But to have them really be sustainable over time, they have to create value either for states, for governments, for employers. Um, and so for these, for these solutions to, to, to really be sustainable over time and to drive impact into the future, somebody else has to pick up the tab. And the only way that happens is if value is created for, for that for that organization, for that any, for a government, for an employer to do that. And so um, in terms of both the scaling and, and innovation work, that's really where we're focused right now. And all three of those ways that we allocate capital, investments, grants, and affiliates, we use each of them both for purposes of innovation and for purposes of scaling. Um, I would say that our investment work Sounds a little bit similar to, to, to the work that Angela mentioned in terms of core. That's probably a little more focused on the identification of innovation. But I would say that um, even in some cases with, with our investment work and certainly with our grant work and with, with our affiliates, we're also increasingly looking at how do we scale? How do we grow? That's why it's important that we grow the work of our affiliates. That's important that we um, you know, pr provide grants that are larger and um, uh, more significant and impactful into just one college, for example. Uh, um, so that's, that's a little bit around how we're, how we're different and what our, what our strategy is at Gates. So um, in terms of the lightning round, you'll be, pleased to, you'll be pleased to learn that we're ahead of schedule, so we don't want to interrupt the cocktail hour. Uh, um, and also, I think we'll have more time for, for questions this way. Uh, um, but one thing I wanted to ask the, the um, my colleagues on the panel was, you know, we, we've seen a lot of changes um, over the course of the last 10 years with respect to how large organizations that are uh, driving or trying to drive um, impact, 
how they allocate capital, how they structure themselves, um, how they approach those questions. What are we, in terms of structure, what are, or in terms of how we allocate capital, what are we still missing? We obviously haven't figured everything out. Um, and while I think it's an improvement, this is just my own opinion, I think the way that we're approaching problems in the social sphere is an improvement over the way we did it 10 years ago. We still, you know, these are persistent problems. Um, and so what are we learning that suggests that we haven't all, um, you know, we, uh, um, We've not reached the perfect state yet, obviously. So what are we learning that points to improvements that we can make with, you know, even the model that we've improved, how can we continue improving is my point. How can we get better at, at it is um, what we're doing. So um, I think Amy, not to put you on the spot, but you mentioned, I think in your comments, um, some of the sort of drawbacks or um, shortcomings with the markets in which we work with some of the other whether they're for-profit companies or some of the other uh, uh, participants in those spaces. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about where you see those, um, where you see those challenges and what we might be able to do um, to improve that? How much time do you have? Um, I mean, you know, I, th so many things come to mind. Um, one that comes to mind is I think capitalism is broken. I think there's a lot of value created from some of the principles of capitalism, but we need to reimagine it. And my colleagues at Omidyar Network from where we spun out are really tackling that issue um, with others in the, others in the space. Um, and um, I'm hoping they make good progress on that. So really looking at things like, you know, are we just looking at shareholder value or are we also looking at community value? and employee value, and are we looking at you know, various sort of ESG um, principles. Uh, another thing that I think about in the social change space of where, so we do in the US, we focus on early childhood, and we focus on the parent students in those children's lives. So the almost one in four post-secondary student who has a child, and these systems are not built for them. Um, and in both of those spaces, as I said, we've started focusing on innovation. We continue to invest in innovation. We're also focusing on policy and movement building, and we're focusing on building evidence and research. And a place where we continue to see a major gap is in C4 funding, in political dollars. So we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing, we are in a very polarized environment, and there are some players who are putting a lot of money into political dollars, and those who are representing those who previously and, and, and currently struggle with, with the systemic barriers to have a voice, um, we don't have a, bun a bunch of C4 dollars in it. So in the early childhood space, for example, right? How many of you have, have a kid? How many of you struggled with childcare during the pandemic, right? And they're in K, K through 12, because school is childcare in some ways. And why do we not look at zero through five childcare as, as a public system? And um, we have an opportunity to really move that right now, and so we need, we need more C4 dollars. Um, and I think the last thing that I would say is sort of what else the system could and should be doing is, um, being more open to all kinds of knowing. So not just looking at the McKinsey reports and the landscape documents, but actually just listening to people who experience the problems every day and who know the assets in their community and know the solutions and you know, just being more proximate and funding those entrepreneurs, those leaders, um, to um, such, such that they have a greater voice in, in these kinds of these kinds of discussions, and glad to see that happening here at South by. I, I would I would echo that. I think both about the issues with our current brand of capitalism, but just the the values of our country in general right now, and and that's why I like I think we're kidding ourselves talking about these innovations going to scale without policy. Um, you, you we have to change the rules of the game. Um, you know, because they're skewed right now. And, and so I think I completely agree with that piece of it. I also think um, 
Tom, related to your question, you know, I think that there's something happening in the space right now, which is this wave of philanthropic capitalism or so-called strategic philanthropy, which the, the Gates Foundation did help herald in, is being questioned, and rightfully so. Um, and so now you're seeing people come back to these same old lessons that they learned 20 years ago about the value of general operating funds and what a, an entrepreneur can do with those to stitch the system together themselves as opposed to answering our grants, which sometimes look a lot more like contracts, to say, deliver this one thing. There's no space for that innovation and growth. And so I think you look at, you know, even on the far end of that spectrum, McKinsey Scott's gifts, where she's just saying straight up, I'm going to trust the people who I'm going to give this money to. Um, I think we're, I think we're going to have a bit of a moment in, in both philanthropy in general, like the traditional grant making philanthropy, as well as these other forms of capital questioning, like what is the right combination? And I agree, I think there's room for all of those, but I think the pendulum probably needs to swing back a little bit from where it has been over the past decade. I just want to pick up on something you said, Amy. It's, it's around like the shareholder value I think a lot about. And, you know, we think about the economist Milton Friedman when he was like the purpose, the social responsibility of a business is to return increased shareholder value, right? And I feel like that was an old paradigm in the 80s, the 90s. And, and what we're seeing, and I'm hopeful about it. Sometimes people say I'm like Pollyanna, but we're seeing a shift now where I do think the regulatory space is going to push businesses to actually lean in more. I think consumers are going to push businesses to lean in more. For so long, we've depended solely on the five, you know, the nonprofit sector to solve all of our problems, and we've really absolved business of doing their part. And so, I, you know, the more that philanthropy can de-risk investments for for-profits and nonprofits that are doing good social work, we'll have more of a vibrant ecosystem out there that are looking at some of these really complex social problems. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is, I don't know if you've been reading though, with the SEC, they have new reporting rules around human capital. So when we're thinking about our investing, it's not only about the product or service that's being delivered for the companies we invest in, it's about who are they hiring? Who are their suppliers? Are they a good citizen in their community? Because all of these things are in con interconnected and they really make a difference. The other piece that I'm thinking a lot about, and this is on the advocacy side, too. You know, policy is the lever. In this moment, with the stimulus dollars, we have unprecedented government built unprecedented government dollars that are being deployed. I wonder, I and mean, this is my wondering, how are they going to be deployed? In the same ways to the same people with the same outmoded training? Or will we have an opportunity to invest government dollars into innovators who are reimagining a world that really works for more people and that is more inclusive? And so a lot of the work that I led at New Profit and now at KPOR, we're looking at investing in democracy entrepreneurs. We're looking in investing in some of our innovators who have this social mission to be able to access government dollars. It can't just be philanthropy. We know that philanthropy within itself is not going to solve all the problems. And I think, you know, what I love about my colleagues here, there's a bit of humility in saying that, you know, we need to partner with each other in radical ways if we're going to ultimately have the impact that we want. So um, on my end, I guess I can answer my own question, but I think it leads to a uh, leads to another question. And it's picking up on something that Amy said in her, her comments um, that, you know, we need to get it, or, or we need to do more than just the um, um, sophisticated McKinsey report or pick your, uh, uh, um, you know, large consulting firm that I'm sure we all use to develop various strategies and pieces of strategy, et cetera. We actually need to get into the communities that we serve and talk to those people. And what are the assets that exist there? We tend to treat a lot of these, um, I'll speak for myself, is um, historically, We've tended to, to to treat a lot of these communities as if they're almost like a, almost like an experiment, and it's all well intentioned. Um, but but you know we talk about sort of low income communities, or we talk about um, you know all the statistics that we see and how we can move the needle in terms of improving whether it's graduation rates or uh, 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 job placement rates. But um, that begins to sort of treat human beings as if they're just just kind of a number to tweak. And so I guess the, the, the thing I've been grappling with, I read an article um, a few weeks ago on this, this topic, which is 
because of that tendency, because of sort of more of a top-down tendency to, um, and you know, that's true, I think, if you're in the education to employment space, if you're in the K-12 space, if you're in climate change, if you're in, you know, um, you can pick your um, particular particular area that you're trying to drive impact. Um, or, you know, if you're in uh, um, childcare, for example. But my, my point is, and my question is, are we so top down and kind of siloed, if you will, with our own particular strategy, whether, as I said, it's completion or something to do with early childhood or workforce preparation that we lose sight of the communities that we're serving? Um, and at least the thesis of this article that I was reading, and it was critical, frankly, of organizations like ours, which are a little more top down and are more national in focus and have a very strict strategy and use um, you know, use McKinsey, use, you, you know, treat these problems as if you're um, solving a scientific, scientific, uh, um, um, you know, concern or issue. And would we be better off focusing on the communities that we're serving and looking kind of across those communities, if you will, and, and the variety of different challenges that the individuals who live in those communities face? And would we be better off taking more of a holistic approach to serving that community to improve some of these outcomes that we care about, whether it's wage gains, whether it's college attendance and completion rates? Would, would we be better off taking more of a um, community-based approach, looking at sort of more holistic issues affecting that community, working to and talking with the individuals in that community, than we are being a little more isolated and distant um, and more focused on our kind of individual national strategy. So I'm curious, I, I think there's a lot to that, frankly, having been around this space for a while and seeing the same issues, like when Patrick was talking about the challenges around data, those are absolute challenges. And those are challenges that are big, uh, uh, um, um, significant challenges. But Patrick and I could have been like, I could have been Patrick saying that 10 years ago. And so would, you know, not to say those aren't, aren't important problems, but are, is a better way of approaching some of these issues actually getting into the communities that we serve and taking a more holistic approach and serving them, looking at the variety of different challenges and barriers um, that these individuals face. So um, that's a long-winded comment slash question, but I wonder if my other colleagues could Tom, evade. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm ha and I'm also looking at the questions here, and there, it, yep. it, it's deeply resonant with the top with the question here around do you engage with community members directly or use methodologies like participatory grant making to guide the work um, so we do and we haven't always and it's been transformative kind of full stop so um, in Kenya we developed a youth advisory board of incredible youth that are shifting our perspective every day in our student parent work we work with Ascend at Aspen, and we have an advisory board of student parents who bring us their expertise. Um, and they are, you know, we, we hire them to do this work, and they transform our work every day. They were the first ones telling us, this was before COVID, you're not thinking enough about mental health. And this was before COVID. Um, and so I would say yes, yes, and more yes. We can't do enough of it. And it's also about changing your team. It's also about transforming your team. I mean, that changes things dramatically, dramatically. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll say, just to, it, it's, it's weaving in your comment, Tom, and, and where you ended around humility. We always talk about being humble in the gap between your intention and your impact. Because this stuff is hard. And these challenges are so entrenched. And so it's about, you know, as best as we can, taking the risk to create change, because it means taking real risk, but um, being as conscious as possible that you're doing as little harm as you possibly can. You can never do, do no harm is a, is a, is a falsehood. Um, so just being really, and, and I sit up here with, with, with great, great humility from that perspective.
So I think I, I come from this from a different perspective. I deeply believe in community involvement, not out of it's the moral thing to do or the nice thing to do. It's really in service of being more effective in your grant making. And so if there are foundations who are not engaging their community, they're just not as effective. Uh, I remember when I joined New Profit three years ago to lead their future of work strategy, we had a team of experts, you know, consultants, who advised us on what our strategy could be and who our advisory board should be and when I looked at the list you know it was a list of all white men with Ivy League degrees and there were literally two women and so I said we're doing a strategy around an equitable future of work like where is the voice of the people who are experiencing this problem like those are the experts that we need to really hear from and so at New Profit I stood up a worker advisory board um, there's a hundred members that are representative of the United States blue states red states rural, urban, um, all of them don't have a four-year degree and they have barriers, other barriers to employment. So some of them have been justice involved, some of them are independent parents. And from day one, they informed our strategy. You know, doing a listening tour, talking to them, working with Goodwill, the Department of Transitional Assistance, taking these experts who are experts on their life and actually paying them for their expertise so that they could advise us on our strategy. When we got ready to invest in entrepreneurs, we actually introduced them to our worker advisory board so they could actually pitch them on their solutions and that our worker advisory board could tell them why or why not it would work in their busy lives. And then on the end of that, they've stayed with us along the way. And it's been an amazing thing. It's been three years now that we've had this worker advisory board. If one of them were in the room now, they see themselves as part of New Profit. They see that, and because and we value them that way. And, and that same theme of expertise you'll see at K-Port Enterprises. We don't make a move unless we know that it's something we're working shoulder to shoulder with someone in the community. We don't believe in swooping down in a community and that we're going to save anyone. Most people in the communities, they know their problems and they know what the solution would be. They just need a seat at the table. And sometimes that means that, you know, I have to stand up and give my seat away and step back. And that's what's really important. So. I'll end it with that, you know, I don't even see it if it is a question of whether we should do it or not. Like, it's just essential if we really want to move forward and solve some of these problems. Yeah, I, I want to stitch together a couple of things that Angela and you and Amy said is there's a bit of a theory of change here, which is, A, if you don't believe it's going to lead to impact, then like you can go through all these motions and it will be uh, for naught because it's not going to be done authentically. So you really do have to go through that. And, and that relates, I think, even to your point, is then what, what are you doing with your own staff? So I'll just give a, a live example here. If we had the staff makeup that we had on, on my team five years ago and tried to do some of the things that we're doing engaging HBCUs right now, they'd just say, take a number, man. I mean, it's not worth my time. You haven't been there before this. Now I've got money flowing in, so take a number. Doesn't matter how big your capital is. We, don't, we only have so much time to focus on real stuff right now. And by bringing in staff with lived experience, HBCU grads, bringing in people who most recently had worked at HBCU, they're like, I know you. We can do this. And so then when, when you get to the question about participatory grant making, then you can talk about participatory grant making. You can talk about co-design. There was a panel, I think, yesterday hosted by Complete College America about some work we're doing on HBCU digital infrastructure, and it's a co-design process. There's no way we could even walk into that conversation with a straight face five years ago. Um, and so you, I think there's each of these steps that you need to go through. And then the participatory grant making, frankly, I think a lot of people think about that, Tom, to your point, in the context of a community. You can do participatory grant making in a national systems level. It's a little bit more complicated because you still have the power as a funder of setting that table, right? And so you got to walk into that understanding, like, what am I bringing into this to even invite people to be part of a participatory process. You've already taken a step using your, your I think, immense privilege. And so you can do it at both levels. Um, I think, you know, to look, Tom, to your point about community-based, like Balmer Group is doing a lot, you know, uh, collective impact work in that space. That's clear that's part of their theory of change. Um, and we have tried that, I will say, at the Gates Foundation, uh, given our cultural dynamics and some of the top-down uh, element you mentioned, it's really hard to work in community authentically. I think that's one of the reasons why we end up staying a little bit higher level nationally. It is, you know, delivery work at scale is super, super hard. I think way harder than the front end of innovation 
um, particularly for uh, a philanthropy like ourselves. Yeah. Well, rather than asking another question, um, why don't, uh, of, of the panel, why don't we, uh, we're two or three minutes ahead of schedule, but this gives more time uh, to take audience questions. As I say, I'm at a disadvantage because I can only see my three fellow panelists. So um, I will defer to them to take, to take questions, but this way we get to hear more from the audience than from ourselves. So, but particularly around on the theme of humility, what we were just discussing, ways in which, I mean, certainly if you have questions of us, ask away, but if you have comments as well about ways we could improve what we're doing, we are, we are all ears to the, to the last, um, last uh, group of comments that my, my colleagues made. So I'll let you guys handle the, handle the questions there. Okay, so the first one is from Jeff. How would you grade your organization's success rate? And you can define what success means for you attached to the grade that you'll give. I'd give us a C trending towards a C plus. Um, our, our success rate is um, to eliminate race and income as predictors of educational success and future economic mobility. And um, that is not all self-contained from the post-secondary system. We have inputs into that system that are, you know, centuries of years of discrimination um, and systemic oppression. So, like, I'm not going to say that that we could own all of that, but if you look at the past 15 years of, uh, you know, Tom mentioned the completion movement, right? Like up through the second half of the last century through, say, 2006, the Spellings Commission. Um, it was all an access discussion in higher education reform. 06, it started this kind of completion or success movement. And it didn't center equity right up front. And so what did we get? We got 10 years of gradual increases in grad rates, about one point per year. Not bad. Uh, opportunity gaps by race and income stayed the same. In some cases, increased. So that was a mistake. Uh, from the field and also the Gates Foundation as a participant in, in that field and as a leader in that field. I say trending C plus because I think <laughs> there's another question about, are you learning from your mistakes? We, you know, if you don't center it up front, you're not gonna get it. You're gonna get, get what you designed for. And so I'm seeing positive movement there. Um, we have looked at the past three years trend line of our grantees. Um, we've assessed capabilities and competencies related to specifically to success with our focus populations. So do you have receipts working with these communities? Um, do you have leadership that is reflective and proximate to those communities? Um, does your theory of change make that explicit that what you're doing or is it this kind of general completion thing? And we've seen dramatic increases on uh, external partners rating the investments we're making and the partners we're partnering with. So I'm optimistic, but see. I'll go last, guys. I'll let you go first before me. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> no problem. That's a really hard question. I, you know, I think I would. I don't know. I, I, I would like. I would like our portfolio to rate us. I would like our partners to rate us. We do. We do do. We do conduct a survey regularly. Um. um I think I, I, I too would be like a C. It's really hard to have an A or an a B in this space. Um, um, I think we've we've worked with some remarkable, remarkable entrepreneurs who've had tremendous impact. And we've also made some taken some big risks that have been massive flops. Um, and so I, I guess I would have to give us a C. And I think that given the work that we have been doing as we've moved from pure impact investor, venture philanthropist, to more deeply understanding the underlying systems and looking more holistically at the tools that we might use, um, I also feel more optimistic about our impact going forward. Angela, it's an easy curve. You've got this. I know. You've got like, this. I'm next up to bat. <laughs> so I'll start with new profit. So. I would give New Profit a C plus, and the reason why is uh, 
Four years ago, we made a concerted effort. We looked at our portfolio and we looked at the founders that we had funded for, you know, 15 plus years. And we saw a trend there. You know, a lot of them were white men, Ivy League degrees. And we, we had our own internal awakening and just awareness that we needed to do things differently. And about three years ago, the leadership at New Profit made a public commitment that going forward, that we would for, uh, fund majority entrepreneurs of color black, Latin, X, and indigenous. Um, I will say we started around 50%. Now I just heard a number from a colleague that we're up to 70% of those entrepreneurs in our portfolio, which is great. But the other piece is funding is only one piece of it. The other is like the wraparound systems, the supports, the acknowledgement of just the systemic barriers that our entrepreneurs face. And I think that's what we're working on now beyond the money. So going to our staff and making sure that we have the right staff with the competencies to see around the corner, that we'll see a list of all white advisors and say, hey, we're missing an independent you know, mom or we're missing somebody who's experienced homelessness. We were building up that staff capacity. The other piece of it is we're actually operating operating in the system itself. So New Profit gives money, but we also raise money, like kind of like a venture philanthropy, a venture capital firm raises from their LPs. A lot of those LPs and investors are not diverse because we know who the money owners are. And so we're working very hard to also diversify who our supporters are, right? And to make sure that they are mission and vision aligned. Um, as it relates to K-Port Enterprises, I'm going to give a full disclosure. When I started and started the strategy at New Profit, I actually looked at K-Port for, um, for inspiration. They've been doing this work with a racial equity lens deeply for over 20 years. Um, if the principles were up here, they, they, they name the things. You know, when you look at the organization itself, it's 90% people of color in leadership positions. It's an all-female leadership team. And so what they've tried to create and we have now there is that our team really mirrors the entrepreneurs that we hope to serve and the communities that we hope to serve. And I'm continually inspired by that because that's aspirational. They're not perfect, so I'd give them a B plus. There's still more work to do, and I think there's always going to be more work to do at the end of the day. Like, you're always going to learn and get better, and you're going to make mistakes, and you'll repeat and try to get better again. I think, I think the funny thing about the, the new profit grade, if I may, yeah. is that it's, it's almost like you could grade yourself in 10 or 15 years and have a different grade because of the way you've invested in uh, social entrepreneurs. Yeah. So like the grade, your grade book's not closed yet. None of our grade books are closed yet, but I think by being really focused about the, those individuals' journeys and what they're gonna do, like you're probably looking at future secretaries of education and leaders of industry and leaders of nonprofit. And so I think by doing that, you invite a different grade 10 to 15 years down the line. And we're already seeing that from some of the first cohorts of leaders doing big, big things, even past second, third venture that they've done. And I'd say probably the same for Kpor as well. Yeah, fingers crossed, that's our hope. So I, I would, um, I'm more in the Patrick Amy camp. What's, 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 what's a little bit different about Strata is we're, we're so new, at, at, you know, at least in terms of our current iteration. Um, where you know we've really been been allocating grants, operating these affiliates, making these investments for, I'll call it five years. Uh, um, we were doing a little bit of it before, but we you know we really put kind of our our um, uh, kind of changed our uniform and became Strata five years ago. And so to the point that Patrick was just making, you know, our first you know our first tranche of investments from a strategic standpoint, you know, they're just. Um, you know, they're just coming around now. Our, uh, you know, our first large tranche of grants. You know, that that information is coming back now. Um, our affiliates. We spent a lot of time just assembling them and building up that shared service enterprise I talked about. So we're still um, we're still new at this. I give us this, and I think we deserve some credit because, like Patrick and some of the other folks on the panel, I think. Initially, we were really focused on what does Strata want to do and getting our name out there in terms of trying to improve um, this kind of national systemic problem around improving the connection between, between education and work. Having said that, though, I'd give us a C because um, I think we were too focused on Strata and not focused enough on the people that we wanted to serve. 
and not that that Strata doesn't want to serve those people and identify and it, but we were the best way for Strata to get its name out there is to do good work and to define its strategy clearly and show impact with the communities that they're serving doing the doing the type of work that we were just discussing with respect to you know really becoming involved in the communities that we serve looking like the communities that we serve we have a lot of work to do that we're not nearly as far along as Angela uh, um, um, and her team is. But um, I, I think um, while I'm pleased that we've, we've, we've gotten ourselves on the map, if you will, in the course of the last, call it half a decade, five years, I think we spent too much time on what our brand and what our, you know, how we wanted to be known versus you're gonna be known well if you do the work well. And if I could go back and change one thing, that's what I would, that's what I go. That's what I would go back and change. But having said that, now I think we have more of an infrastructure in place to do precisely that, which is to 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 be more involved in the communities that we serve, look more like them, have the infrastructure in place to be able to measure our impact, have a clear strategy. Um, but yeah, I, I'd give ourselves a C. So. Wow, you guys came to the wrong panel if you were looking for good advice. Sorry. Apparently. <laughs> I think we're all going to need a drink after this. I know. So. I think we have time for one more question though, Angela. Perfect. Or, so, yeah, no, yeah. I'm happy to say it. So are there times when your nonprofit grantees or partners challenge some of your for-profit partners? If so, how do you manage this? I'm happy to start, I, I can definitely start. So um, a couple of things, one is, you know, with KPOR and they have a history of investing in for-profit organizations, we have a rigorous criteria in who we invest in. So one is we're investing in entrepreneurs who are really addressing barriers in the communities that they, they serve. We're looking for very diverse teams. We make sure that our founders know that we value equally profit and impact. And so what we haven't seen is a lot of conflict in that regard between our for-profit and non-profit investments because we try to be aligned across the foundation. You know, my role sits across our foundation and our impact arm. I'm on the investment committee, so you'll see a lot of alignment there. An interesting thing that I've seen new and different is nonprofits who are thinking about doing more service contracts and fee for service and more revenue generating um, opportunities, seeking more revenue generating opportunities. So there was one person, one organization in our portfolio, they're a nonprofit, but they had an opportunity to work with Amazon. And in working with Amazon, it was going to help them scale their impact their mission-related impact, and there would be you know, revenue that would be recognized from that. There were a portion of the staff who was like, I can't believe that you would work with Amazon. Like, that seems completely against our values. And I saw that in the nonprofit and the specific leader, how she had to wrestle with that, and how as a team they had to be really clear on what are the boundaries if they are gonna work with for-profits, what are the deal breakers, what needs to be true for them to stay in the relationships, and if you do see the deal breakers, what's the exit strategy? So while I haven't encountered it, those are things that we think about deeply because we know if there hasn't been conflict, there could be, and then it's really about how you react to it. The only thing I'll add is on several of the for-profits we sit on, we have, as, the, as an impact investor who is impact first, right, we have helped create an impact advisory committee within the board. Um, and when we do have people in our portfolio and network who, um, this has really only happened once, express some concern, we said, come, help, come join this impact advisory committee. You know, come, come be a, come be a part of the solution because, like you, we start with like values first. You know, it, it all it all starts with values and mission. Um, um, but otherwise, we haven't we haven't really seen a conflict. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to my panelists. And next year, I uh, hope the next time we do this panel, I'm there with you in person. So, hope you all have a great afternoon and a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Yeah.